interesting topic today. Uh, our, our series has been um, Encounters with Jesus. And we're in John chapter 9 today. The encounter that Jesus has with a blind man who was blind from birth. And there's quite a, quite a deal that goes on here. Quite a collision of worlds that takes place in this miracle that Jesus does on the Sabbath. And it gets Jesus in trouble, again. Uh, and it's really quite, quite an interesting story. Uh, I've always been impressed with people who have limitations that are obvious and still do amazing things. I competed in high school in rings. I didn't have an iron cross, but there was a guy who was from Sprague High School that didn't have uh, legs, and he would perform on the rings moves that nobody had ever heard of, because he had this all upper body strength, and he would dismount landing on his torso. It was very difficult, and it was like imp impressive. Have you ever... Have you ever run into people who've, got, who've had a lot of things that are difficult in their lives, and yet they still rise above it. They still do amazing things. I know many of you, and the struggles and the life experiences that you've had are difficult, and yet there is a witness and a testimony of who God is. <laughs> I've... I shook Mike's hand today, and, and Brenda and Daryl and Mike and Christian have lost their daughter and wife, Sarah. Has it been a month? Wow. Why is it that you people encourage me all the time? It's not, something's... God is working in your life. Here's her services this Saturday. If you'd like to attend, it's 1 o'clock. And we're going to celebrate her life. It doesn't take away from the sadness. But in the middle of that loss of this beautiful young lady, there is a, a spirit of of strength that rests with them. And, and I shake their hands and I, how you doing? I start to try and be a comforting pastor and I find that they're comforting me. Have you ever noticed that? With people who know the Lord and go through hard things. Uh, the, we went on a, a missions trip to Tijuana, Mexico and we went to a hospice care center up on top of a mountain. I drove a bus up there, which was crazy because the road was a hairpin curve. I had to stop. It was a flat-nosed bus. We hung over the edge to turn around so I can get him down their angle. And as we hung over the edge, the little girl standing next to me was standing in the well, and she goes, ooh, there was wreckage of an old bus. Ah, hit reverse. We lived. But we got up to the top of that place, and I met a man from Guatemala who was hit by a car, paralyzed, and was dying. He had other blood disease, and he had just a few, and he was the strongest testimony of who Jesus is I've ever heard. It was just amazing. And we went up there to bless him, and we left all blessed. Jesus came into contact with a blind man who was blind from birth, who had begged and begged, and that was his thing. And Jesus stopped and healed him. He, he, this is the one where he spits in the dirt and makes mud, you know. And it's really kind of 
sounds gross to spit and make mud. Well, except for you people. But I mean, you... <laughs> there's something, though, and as I was thinking about this, how is it that God took dust and formed man in the beginning, and then here Jesus, God, was making dust and combining it with his elements and <laughs> putting it in this guy's eye and said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And as he went and he washed, he could see. Let's read this story. It's quite a bit of reading, so hang on. My wife says, can you have someone else read for you? <laughs> Any volunteers? <laughs> That's what I thought. Okay. John chapter 9, verse 1. As he went along, he saw a blind man from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus said, but this happens so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. Speak, this is speaking of Jesus, his time. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claim that he was. Others said, no, he just looks like him. <laughs> but he himself insisted, I am the man. Then how were your eyes opened, they asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus came and made mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash, and so I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. They brought the, Pharisee, the Pharisees, the man who had been blind. They brought, to the, excuse me, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. And now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was the Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud in my eyes. The man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, <laughs> for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided, and they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? Is It was your eyes he opened, and the man replied, and I think he was at a loss for words. He, he, he was a prophet. They still not, did not believe that he had been blind and he had received his sight until they had sent for the man's parents. Now they're getting the mom and dad involved. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that he can now see? We know he's our son, the parents answered. And we know he was born blind, but how can he see now? Or who opened his eyes? We don't know. Ask him. He's of age. He will speak for himself. Now, key verse 22. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had already decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That is why his parents said he is of age. Ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, well, whether he's a sinner or not, speaking about Jesus, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Um, there's some things I want to point out. Because this guy was impressive. He was just giving his story. They said, well, Jesus must be a sinner if he's healing you on the Sabbath. How weird and messed up can religious people get? 
And before you answer that too quickly, <laughs> it can happen. There's a book written a few years ago called The Accidental Pharisee, which talks about us kind of getting into this creepy mode of performance, this creepy mode of equating hard things with sin, good things with good living, and you have to be super careful because there is a Lord Jesus who loves you and wants to deal with your heart and heal you. And you have to understand that some of the concepts you have received, some of the things that you have learned in religion world are not true. And you have to understand what the scripture says. That's why it's really important that you go to scripture and learn for yourself more than just from me. If I can do anything, it's to encourage you to go to scripture and take your time with it and learn and have a good attitude on the way. Don't read scripture to try and back up your preconceived notion. Don't say, oh, I know there's some sin going on in this world. I'm going to find scriptures that te- talk about it. Yeah, there's this one and there's that one. Wrong attitude. You need to humbly go before scripture and say, God, talk to me today. Let me know what I need to learn from you. And he'll help you with that. Well, one of the most impressive people that operated with limitations was a young boy named Dylan Workman. He was born uh, with one arm that was not, it's hard to explain, it was almost like it was on kind of backwards, it went, the elbow went the other way, and he had three fingers. And as a little kid, he was a hilarious comedian. He could whip his arm around the back of his head, put it on top of his head, and he would do things like aardvark and start talking like a little puppet. He was hilarious. Came to our church as a little kid, and I said, oh, what a fun kid. And we enjoyed having him. Um, he became an extremely good scholarship football player. And he's an incredible man of God with family of his own. People with limitations can achieve great things. And I want you to know that you have limitations too. And God doesn't want you to just ignore them. He wants to use them to expand the understanding of who Jesus is. Because when Jesus came and his disciples said right away, okay, we got to have answers for this. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? That he was born blind. Something must have gone terribly wrong in their past that this is going on. And if we're not careful, we'll take that home, that same attitude home with us and think that that's how we explain life. That when good things happen, we've been living good. Or when bad things happen, we've been living bad. Okay, first point. If you're taking notes or filling in the blanks. What now is a better question than why for hard times or hard things? The disciples asked, why? When a better question, if you're going through a difficult thing, is what now? God, help me with this. Uh, There's a, a time when we went through with our kids. We had two little girls who are now... Middle-aged people. But when they were little toddlers, you remember the phase when they would ask why? (laughs) You have to go to bed now. Why? Because it's nighttime. Why? Because you got... Don't you remember being exhausted? And don't you remember that those questions just kept coming and coming? And pretty soon... You just have to say, you have to stop asking why now. I wonder if that's how God is with us. Uh, I don't have enough money this month, God. Why? Uh, I'm not feeling so good. Why? Um, 
We want to find the reason. That is a normal response, but it is mostly done by toddlers. <laughs> if you don't want to be a spiritual toddler, you have to start curbing your why questions to what next, God? What now? What do you want me to do about this? What in the middle of this situation, what do you want to accomplish? What is it that you need me to learn in this moment? It is a, it's a more mature question. The disciples were like still immature because they're just like, hey, what is the reason for this blind guy? Who sinned? Somebody must have caused this effect on this guy. Um. Why, what now is a better question than why. Second thing I want to share is a religious spirit rules with fear. Uh, I want to just, I want you to understand what is going on here. These Pharisees were losing church people to a devotion to the Messiah. Think about it. The whole purpose of their Jewish tradition was to expect and wait for the Messiah. The Messiah shows up and starts healing people and changing worlds and lives. The words out of his mouth was changing everything. And they, No, we got to keep church the way it is. We can't mess up our tradition. We can't compromise the Sabbath by healing people on the Sabbath. What a concept. It's so deceptive. It's a spirit that is in this world that is not a Jesus spirit or a Holy Spirit or a God spirit. It is the spirit of the Antichrist. Let me just, ah, I said it. It's, the, it's an evil spirit, this religious spirit. If you've been messed up by a religious spirit, you know the damage it does. It causes you to feel terrible about yourself. It causes you to question everything in your world. It causes you to think God is mad at you and distant from you. It's all the things the enemy wants to accomplish. It's a religious spirit. Ooh. And we have to acknowledge it because it'll creep its way into our worlds on a regular basis. And if you're not careful, it can, you can kind of get in step with it. Because we don't want people to mess up our religious tradition. We don't want people to mess up our situation. Um... They brought to the Pharisees, verse 13, the man who had been blind. And now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was the Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. Well, he had put mud in my eyes and washed, and now I see. And some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. I met a man called Larry Norman. If you were a child of the seven, early 70s and that era, Larry Norman was a long-haired rock and roller who sang a song that was, quickly became my favorite song. Sipping whiskey from a paper cup. <laughs> Drown your sorrows till you can't get up. Why don't you look into Jesus? He's got the answer. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> guess, guess how many churches he got welcomed into. <laughs> when he first started out, not only was he not welcomed, he was accused of being a compromiser. 
A person who grew his hair long, a person who preached the gospel with a beat that was obviously the same beat that summoned demons. <laughs> you didn't hear that before? Oh, baby. Came out of certain demonic cultures that they had the rock and roll beat, and it was like calling the devils. How stupid. Sorry if I hurt your feelings there. Can I just tell you, don't become a Pharisee. We can't do it. We have to hold the line. Well, Larry Norman became a friend because he moved to West Salem, Oregon, and I got to meet him and talk with him on a regular basis at 1 o'clock in the morning getting something at the grocery store. He always shopped late, and I did too because Lila wanted snacks. I, <laughs> <laughs> One of us wanted snacks. <laughs> but he was tormented and, and uh, banished and had to over. He went to the streets and sang, and people came to Jesus. And then the Jesus movement hit. And then Love Song came along and started singing good music too. And, and, and then Larry Norman wrote a song, Why Does the Devil Have All the Good Music? And then it just started. And he actually was welcomed into churches, ultimately. But initially, no. Initially, there's a religious spirit that was wrapped its arms around our Christian culture. And I'm just telling you, it can happen to us still. If we're not aware. And spiritually awake is one of our guiding values. And we have to be aware of what is going on. The st strategies of the enemy. And we have to be keenly aware. And you will feel like a compromiser if you hug the wrong person. Or if you greet someone who, who is maybe not somebody who normally is accepted. But I'm telling you, Jesus touched them. And ministered to them. And it will challenge you. Okay. The religious spirit rules with fear. Oh, man. They brought his parents. Uh, in the, verse 20 says, We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind, but how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him, he's of age. He will speak for himself. Don't get us involved with this miracle of my son seeing. Whoa. His parents said this in verse 22 because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. They were going to lose their church jobs. They were going to lose their place in the synagogue. They had worked so hard all their lives to get their foot in the door and get settled. And they were all a part of the synagogue. And now this Jesus guy came along and healed their son and messed up their system. And the parents threw him under the bus to save their <laughs> place. Thank you, by the way, church family, for not thinking your position in the church is something you own or something that you have to hang on to because there's going to be a replacement for you. Somebody is going to take your job. Somebody's going to take my job. Hopefully, before I am asked <laughs> it's not a religious statement or a political statement for me to say I don't want to be Joe Biden <laughs> no 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 don't want politics in church we want Jesus in church but I, don't, I want you to know that there's lessons going on all around us about the fact that this life keeps moving and God is stirring and working and there is a generation coming on behind us 
that's amazing. They're not, look around, there's so many young 20s and 30s in here that are, they're the muscle of this machine. They're the ones that are going to run the world and they're the ones that are going to reach this region for Jesus. It's not us old bald-headed, gray-haired folks. We're just trying to set the table for them to take it to the next place. And if we can do that, we'll be ready to get out of their way. But if we're religious and if we're hanging on to our synagogue like the parents, we will throw people under the bus to preserve our comfort. Don't let that happen. The religious spirit is the strongest, most evil spirit in our culture. And it is damaging people. Okay. Hobby horse. Um, so Mark and Kathy come to our church when we planted it in Shoto. And they had two young boys. And they were amazing. One of them was... My friend Dylan, who had his arm. And they were a little beaten up as they came to our church. They had moved from Missoula. And I started to have a conversation with them. And they said, well, we've gone through kind of a hard thing. We left, we left the fellowship that was really difficult for us. And I said, what happened? They said, well, they said to us, if you have a son that's born with this kind of problem... There must be some kind of sin in your past that you need to deal with. They were young, vulnerable, new believers. They didn't know. They were honestly, okay, well, let's see what, you know, good-hearted people will say, okay. What is it, God? Show us. And then they feel terrible about their son. But then... As time went on, they started to catch a glimpse of this Jesus who heals on the Sabbath. They caught a glimpse of this Jesus who explained when the disciples said, Who sinned? Is it, is it his parents or is it him or what happened? His forefathers? What's the deal here? We have to have an answer. And this Jesus who said, No, it's not any of that stuff. It's not the sin problem. It's the idea that God's glory is going to be presented in this life. There's a testimony coming forth. There's a spiritual power that's coming forth out of this loss, this pain, this struggle. They got so free about their child's handicap. And he was so comfortable with it. He was just an amazing man who understood who he was and that he had a special touch from God to make a difference in the world. Um, the, the answer to this kind of spiritual abuse is an encounter with Jesus. And the encounter with Jesus heals deeply it heals the parts of you that are just so protected. There is a there is a culture in our country right now that is struggling from their hurts and wounds from engagement with religious Christians. I hate to say that. I'm not trashing the church here. I'm just trashing and calling out this religious spirit that's in the world, and we're not going to put up with it anymore. We have to have a freedom of the gospel to, to embrace us and heal us. Third key thought, Jesus is drawn to the abused, to the outcast. He is drawn to them. Oh, man. We're studying this through in sermon team. And I got to this part, and I just I got emotional. It was just, it was just such an emotional thing. 
Jesus, verse 35, Jesus had heard that they had thrown him out. This is the boy who was healed from blindness, and then he got thrown out of the synagogue. And he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Oh, listen, to, I, read, I gotta slow down. Verse 35, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, and when he found him, oh, Jesus heard that his wound was there, and when he found him, Jesus went after him. He knew about it because he'd heard about it. Of course, he knows about it now in your life from his Holy Spirit. And he hears about your abuse and your wounds and your things you've gone through. He hears it and he comes for you. He looks for you. He, and when he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so I may believe in him. And Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. And then the man said, Lord, I believe, and worshiped him. Jesus is drawn to the abused. Oh, man. Uh, if you are or have been a person who's suffered abuse. I am so, so sorry for that kind of thing. There's physical abuse. There's people that know how to abuse people physically so nobody knows where the bruises are. They kick them in places or hit them in places where nobody can see the bruises. You know this is from the pit of hell, and this is what's messing us up. People who are spiritually abused are spiritually abused in places people can't see as well. It might be just a little step forward that you want to take, and somebody, somebody stopped you. Somebody complained about you. Somebody said you weren't spiritual enough. Somebody said you aren't holy enough. Somebody said you've got too much sin in your life. That's why you can't get anything right. <laughs> uh, does anybody have too much sin in your life? I hate it when I'm the only guy raising my hand. <laughs> See, any sin is too much sin. Can I just, as we close this time, Psalms 147.3 said he heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. I want you to know there's healing for you. There's freedom for you. There might be a journey out. There might be a time where you might have to make an appointment and get some counseling and help and talk things through. But I'm telling you, there is freedom for you. There is wholeness for you. There's a place for you to come that is just like, okay, Lord, here I am. And the answer to your wounds and to your hurts are Jesus and an encounter with him. Not an encounter with some preacher or some system that's different. It's an encounter with Jesus. It's who he is, and it's a personal connection with him, and it's an intimate thing that he wants to come. He sought this boy out. He went to him and found him and revealed to him who he was, and some of us need that today. Would you bow your heads? Oh, Lord, thank you for caring about us. Thank you for talking to us. And those secret places that are so tender. Lord, as we sit together, we just want you to know that we need you to help us. We don't know where to turn. Help us to find someone to talk to. Help us to reach out to a friend. Help us to talk things through about the wounds and the hurts. Lord, would you touch and heal today? And Lord, I ask that you would um, help us to be spiritually awake to those around us that need a listening ear. In your name we pray, amen.